Now let me introduce Dr. Sam Ogukani Ohio Gan, who is Senior Scientist and Cultural Advisor at the Nature Conservancy. Born and raised in Hawaii, Dr. Gan received his bachelor's degree here in zoology um, at UH Manoa. He, he received his master's in zoology and a doctorate in animal, animal behavior at the University of California at Davis. Sam has over 35 years of experience in Hawaiian ecology, um, from biological inventories and research, field ecology, entomology, ethology, modeling, and biological database management. He's also versed in Hawaiian culture, history, and language. He supplied his island conservation expertise in cooperative projects and workshops around the world, from the Galapagos of the Philippines, Pompeii, Palau, Jamaica, Okina Okinawa, Amazonia, and Rapa Nui. He's presented on Hawaiian ecosystems and at the Smithsonian uh, in Berlin and in Paris. He gave a tremendous TED talk on Maui uh, last September, Lessons from a Thousand Years of Island Sustainability. Um, Dr. Gunn has a particular fondness for trilobites, for native Hawaiian plants, for happy faced spiders and posting photos of delicious meals on Facebook. He has served on the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the Board of Trustees for the Native Hawaiian Cultural and Arts Program, the Bishop Museum Association Council, and is an at-large member of the Hawaii State Board of Land and Natural Resources. And if that's not enough, uh, he has just been confirmed to sit on the State Endangered Species Recovery Committee. Last month, uh, Dr. Gunn joined the Hokulea crew uh, on a voyage to Aotearoa. Al Al Thank you. For over 12 years, Sam studied Oli, traditional Hawaiian chant, and Hula with Kumu John Lake, a master of Hawaiian religious and cultural protocols. He was initiated in 2003 as Kahuna Kaka Laleo, a practitioner of Hawaiian chant and protocol. For his contributions to conservation biology and Hawaiian cultural practice, Sam was honored last year by the Hongpa Hongwaji Mission of Hawaii with the designation of Living Treasure of Hawaii. We certainly agree and wish to welcome and thank him for making the time to join us today. Boy, where do I go from there? <laughs> Uh, let's see, I'm going to turn all the lights off now. The second one from the top. Second right here. Hey, that's good. Okay. Um, so you can see the, you can see the, uh, the title of this um, lecture. Um, in this text, Kamo'o Olelo Hawaii, the 19th century Kanaka intellectual Kepelino, wrote, Ahu kumpana haia Hawaii imiloa, enoi iwarimai no kahaole a aole pauna hana Hawaii imiloa. So a, a heap of amazing things can be learned about Hawaii, and however diligently the foreigner inquires, he cannot completely fathom all of the doings of far-seeking Hawaiians. So this presentation on Hawaiian science, ikeo kapoe imiloa, knowledge of a far-seeking people. Oh, this is where I get to test it, not this way. Yeah. Um, far-seeking people, is inspired by Kepelino's characterization of Hawaiian knowledge as imi loa, far-seeking. Now, he acknowledged that not all Hawaiians would be imi loa. There are many uh, Hawaiians in his time and today who are perfectly content to just know about where they are currently or, or the like. But uh, in the time of Kepelino, and certainly in the time of ancient Hawaii, there were certain individuals whose task it was to go far and wide and learn all they could. They were often the kapu of the ali'i, they were often the advisors to the chiefs. Um, sometimes they would be sent to a uh, family of the chief on a different island altogether so that they could learn the traditions and the, and the knowledge of that island and bring it back to, uh, to the uh, chief that they normally serve. So this idea of the imiloa uh, is an ancient idea and one that is still practiced today. Hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, kuwe manwe, tiyalo akune kapulea kalau, 
kulia kalania u yana mu yana u tane heluna tane heila lo ka aka u ka ahema kuma kania ikalan he kili ka aka ikalan awila nu ma ke ha ikalan pane ikalan yo la ke kana o mai talo e ata ike kamana ya e ka honwara o wa hala wa li yo ka hi wa yo ita wa ole lo eli eli ka me chant for enlightenment is full of imagery it was images of biology that eo koen hakis acknowledged in the first place images of place the hakalao with the hawks roost images of meteorology and the winds thunder and lightning images of governance and leadership um, in such lines as pane kalami eo lake kanaka there is answer to the chief and the and the world lives um Images of religion, Uli, the goddess of resuscitation, and a forest deity was mentioned early in the in the chant. Um, all wielded toward the goal of enlightenment. It's intended to put you into a, a framework where you take many threads and concepts and create a balanced result. It hints at the way at the way Hawaiian learning is not only a matter of intellect, but of practical skill, knowledge, spiritual growth. Kaloea kaike kamana. Um, that is the skills, the knowledge, and the spiritual strength. A parallel to the idea of holistic, uh, of a holistic being as being mature physically, mentally, and spiritually. So there are also whole ailona in this chant. That is signs, signs of uncertainty, the mumbling and grumbling um, and the searching. Neheluna uh, ilalo um, searching above and below, right and left. Uh, of the flash of insight, like the light bulb going off, the lightning flashing, zigzagging across the heavens. Um, and also the weighty consequences of decisions based on knowledge. Um, right, the, the people live. So before we go further, I do want to acknowledge my training in dual worlds. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm, a Western, I'm Western trained as a conservation biologist. I earned my bachelor's degree right here at UH. In fact, last time I sat in here, the desks were completely different. I was taking organic chemistry. Um, uh, uh, um, before, I learned, before earning my master's degree in zoology and my PhD in ethology, study of animal behavior, both from the University of California at Davis. I studied the behavior, ecology, and evolution of the Hawaiian happy faced spider, and at the same time its role in native Hawaiian forest habitats. I've seen firsthand perhaps more native Hawaiian plants and animals in my work as an ecologist with the Nature Conservancy than most Kanaka see in a few lifetimes, and I make it my duty to these native species to know their names and their status on all of the islands. But I owe my Ike Hawaii and my Na'au Hawaii, my traditional knowledge and intuition, to many Kumu, um, but the one who I sat with for the last dozen years and from whom I learned Oli, Hawaiian chant and protocol, and who put me through the Uniki Hu Elapo um, to emerge as a practitioner of Oli and protocol, a Kabuna Ka Kalaleo. Um, that one is Kumu John, Kiola Maka Ainana, Kalahu Yo Kalani no Kamehameha Ekolude. I'm shown here uh, leading us in chants for Queen Lili O Kalani's birthday at Yolani Palace some years ago. But this time I have with you today is to discuss Hawaiian science. What is it? What distinguishes it? Why should you understand it? Besides the fact that some of it might appear on the exam in the future. Um, let's start with some recent views of the relationship between science and Hawaiian culture. Now, recently, there have been some ostensibly polar interactions between science and Hawaiian communities. Ostensibly, I say. Now, it gives the impression that Hawaiian culture has very little to do with science. But let's examine this a little bit more closely. Interesting how these particular issues um, have each, in their own way, grown into hot topics. Even though the first time I showed this slide, I think, was maybe five or more years ago. But um, the the 
general impression from some of these arguments, some of these polarizations, is that science is not Hawaiian and that book science is useless when dealing with Hawaiian issues. And both of these are, I think, incorrect ways to look at the, at the issues. Um, science is a process. It's not restricted to Western civilization. And Ike Hawaii, traditional Hawaiian knowledge, can provide value to our modern endeavors. That's the premise of the day. But what is science? I mean, you guys are, are in a science class, and so you should know that science is an approach to learning, right? It's marked by empiricism, that is observations, manipulations of conditions, that is experimentation, um, predictions of what will occur, modeling, um, testing and replication, and so-called proof of those hypotheses. Um, you know, when we, when we look at science, it's really not a matter of proof, it's a matter of surviving disproof, attempts to disprove, right? And then finally, transmission of information uh, in the Western context via publication. So, it's pretty straightforward that if we're going to be talking about Hawaiian science, or science in, in the context of Hawaiian culture, then it's a matter of looking at each of these elements of the scientific approach and seeing how that fits in, in a Hawaiian viewpoint. So, as far as empiricism is concerned, it's quite clear that many elements of a traditional Hawaiian approach are quite consistent with what we would call the scientific approach. Hawaiian traditional knowledge was empirical. It's based on repeated observations of phenomena in the world, land, sea, sky, bent on detecting and expressing correlations and testing predictions and consequences. Many orelo no eao, that is wise sayings, take on the form of correlative statements, as in the following example. The willy willy blooms, the sharks bite. Ooh, and I just noticed that it switched my Palatino font into a generic Helvetica. So one of these days it's going to hit one of those things where it doesn't have a font and it's going to be gibberish on the screen. I'm going to have to make sure that I test my, my font uh, handling on different machines. But at least it's readable this time. Um, Puaka willy willy nanahu kamano. The willy willy blooms, the sharks bite. So the blooming season for Willy Willy is at the end of the Kaubela, the hot season, and before the rains of the Hokoilo, the wet season. Um, this matches the peak aggregations of sharks in shallow waters that Hawaiians call lalani kalalea, the rows of protruding fins that occur at the same time. So the practical observation, um, the consequence is uh, predicting shark behavior through a land phenomenon is obvious. Long before you enter the water, you know to be watchful for the sharks, especially watchful. Or how about this observation? Puakeko kumai kaheke. That is, the sugarcane are blooming, the octopus are appearing. In Hawaii, ko blooms at the start of the Ho'oilo, about November, and this correlates with the peak abundance which, uh, period of mature heke on the reefs. So, we call that heke come into maturity within a year and live no longer than about 18 months. That means that any seasonality in mating creates cohorts that are planktonic and therefore invisible during at least half of the year. When they approach an edible size, they would rather suddenly make their appearance to observant reef fishers who made the initial correlative um, observations. With this equally famous correlation, pala kahala momona kavana, kahala are ripe, the sea urchins are fat with eggs. I don't know if you guys enjoy hot uke uke as much as I do, but you start to ono for them when the ripe, fragrant fruit of the hala are falling on the ground. So um, that correlation turns from an intellectual one into one that your whole body just recognizes. So when you smell the hala on the ground, you immediately, I mean, you, your stomach starts to rumble for, for hot uke uke. So this kind of seasonal correlation statement is the product of centuries of generational corroboration of older observations. But for how many more generations will these Oda Lono Eao continue to hold true if, say, global climate changes occur on land and sea that shift one or both of these cycles? Um, the perspective of the Imi Loa is that broken correlations will fade and that new correlations will be observed, suggested, and tested as they always have. In fact, the classical Oda Lono Eao will remind us as historical observations of times when the world was different. Going back to the Willy Willy and the Sharks, the utility of Olelo no Eao goes far beyond the empirical observations of a natural correlation. The meaning of this saying depends on the context in which it is said. 
Um, when, someone, when something beautiful or desirable appears, even in modern society, someone might say, ah, the sharks are circling now. Um, whether that's the parking space that you were vacating and you notice the car is gathering, the last piece of Maui Manju on the plate being eyed by you and your friends, um, or that beautiful woman surrounded by suitors, Kauna is the term for secondary contextual meaning and is a major part of Hawaiian communication. The hidden meaning in Hawaiian statements um, is, is called Kauna and lies at the heart of Hawaiian wisdom and interpretation of Ololono Heo. Natural phenomena in ancient Hawaii were often characterized as kino lao, physical manifestations of akua, of deities. For example, lono was seen as the akua of the winter rains and presided over the seasonal cultivation of oala, of sweet potatoes, and ipu, gourd, in the drier uh, arable lands. Um, the season of lono is called the ho'oilo, the Hawaiian winter or wet season. It's marked by the makahiki, the start of the traditional Hawaiian New Year. Um, only during this time of year was cultivation of rain-dependent crops of the leeward drylands possible, and sometimes the window for cultivation was very narrow. Many of the heiau servicing agriculture in such zones were dedicated to Lono, and were heiau ho'oluua, that is, temples where prayers were directed to bring rain. Um, some of the chants to Lono directly indicate the connection between that major Hawaiian god and the meteorology of winter, uh, for example, through the evocation of clouds. With such chance, the kahuna could evoke rain as needed, for example, in famine times. So here's, uh, here's the start of one of those chants. That is, um, well, you see the translation there, I thought I had um, So important are these cloud signs in the heavens that when you consult traditional Hawaiian sources, there are hundreds of names of cloud forms, clouds that prognosticate the coming weather and which were studied intently and named. Um, here are a few examples. Um, the Aupua'a, the Aoloa, the Aomanu, the Aoilio'ula, Aoni'o, Aopu'ulima. Um, all of these at their simplest level are visual features in the heavens formed of condensed water. But when combined with traditional knowledge systems, they become important ho'ailona, signs, indications of times to plant, times to avoid oceanic voyaging, times to prepare offerings to the fishing gods, times to set medicinal herbs to dry, times to store water. Um, sometimes attention to these ho'ailona made the difference between life and death. But as much attention that is paid to the more prominent kinolao of the akua in their realm, it must be pointed out that in the Hawaiian perspective, all of the thousands of living denizens of the Wawakua are also considered manifestations of the gods and can hold huge significance um, that belies their physical stature. Um, take the tiny fern, Shizea robusta, that bears the name Oali'i Makali'i. That's easy to completely disregard, growing inconspicuously among mosses and seedlings on the forest floor high in the mountains. But there's a chant to Dono that in the very first line links this fern to the deity of winter, wet season, the Ho'oilo. Uh, ho um, the chant starts, Elono ita oa li'i, elono ni moe, elono ni lani, elono kalana mainugu, and on and on and on. But the very first form of Lono that's mentioned is this Lono ita oa li'i. Um, so the chant establishes a connection of Lono to this fern, oa li'i. But if you're familiar with the traditions of Lono, you know that he is the god presiding over the Makahiki season, the celebration of fertility of the land, and the promise of the bounty of the new year. So, does anyone know the astronomical ho'ailona of the advent of the Makahiki? That is, what star uh, or constellation of stars marks the Makahiki season? Makaliki. Yeah, the Makaliki. And so, a fern with the name Oali'i Makali'i um, uh, imbues that particular, that particular significance doubly upon this fern. And when I was first taught the, the name of this fern, you know, it was a little toothbrush fern sticking out of the, out of the um, ground, and I asked the person who I knew knew the name of that fern what it was, and he said Oali'i Makali'i. And I said, Oali'i Makali'i. I said, what does that mean? I said, Oali'i fern 
with small eyes, right? That was the interpretation I got. And so I didn't think twice about Mahali'i as the Pleiades. Uh, Mahali'i means Maha is small, I mean Li'i is small and Maha is face or eye. And so Wali'i Mahali'i would be the small eye of Wali'i. Uh, it took years before the connection between the Mahali'i and the Pleiades um, came place into my, into my mind. And that um, it's no coincidence that during the start of the Ho'o'ilo, this thing comes into maturity and the orange and the orange brown um, spores mark the maturity of the Wali'i Makali'i frame. So, um, and so there, there it is. A tiny little fern suddenly takes on uh, the significance of a major Hawaiian god and, uh, and one of the two major seasons of the year. Kinola assignments were complex and they were based upon the context of the symbolic natural phenomena. There were countless variations of natural phenomena and not surprising, um, there were the Kimiakua of 40,000 gods, each with names, personalities, and duties. In contrast to Lonoku, for example, is the god of the hot summer season and of war and of chiefly governance. But that simplified dichotomy does not suffice to characterize the many um, Kinola of Ku. If Ku is a god of war, it might make sense that the Koa tree itself sharing the name for a warrior might be among the Kinola of Ku. But the red color that is symbolic of Ku can also be found in the red Lehua blossoms, the red of the Eevee feathers, the red of certain fishes of the sea, such as the Aleo Veo. Ku Ula, red Ku, is the main god for fishing, and the connection of fishing in the sky is seabirds. So another Kino of Ku is the Hawaiian fairy tern, in fact named Manuo Ku the bird of Ku. Unlike migratory seabirds such as the Moli or albatrosses and the Kolea or the plovers, which appear only in winter and were therefore the Kino of Lono, Manuo Ku are year-long residents and their flocks wheeling above schools of fish were the guidance of Ku Ula to the Lawaipa, to the fishermen. Thus the behavior of elements of the universe were described in terms of the behavior of the Kino Lao, themselves expressions of the uncountable gods. See how that works? So the Kino Lao system is far more complex than this chart depicts, but the point of it is that between all of the Kinyakua, every season, every human activity, every food, and everything in the natural world would be represented. In this manner, all observations and connections of the world around you could be organized in terms of their presiding Akua. And of course, I'll point out that classification and naming and categorization of your universe is the hallmark of science. So, this is one, oh, I'm sorry. Did I go backwards? I did, yeah. There we go. Now, there we go. So, this chart, for example, shows that Ku uh, takes on the color red and is the god of the Kaubela, the summer season, and that there are various crop plants such as coconut, breadfruit, uh, um, sorry, wild gaze, what, paper mulberry, uh, uh, food crops such as dog and chicken are all associated with Ku. And Lono, for the wet winter season, and the crops that grow during those times, Ipu and Uala, that is, uh, gourds and sweet potatoes. Kukui of the lowlands, because Kukui, even though it's a tree, and you might think that it's associated with Ku, uh, who is the god of upright hard things. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Kukui, when it falls, rots quickly, right? It's not a hardwooded tree. Uh, Kane. Uh, Yellow is Kane's color. Black was Lono's color, the color of winter storm clouds. Um, Kane's color is yellow, the rising sun, Olena, and various other yellow wooded things like Ahakea, um, the yellow gunnels on racing canoes. Now it's yellow fiberglass, uh, but it used to be the yellow Ahakea wood. Uh, so, yeah, so all of those kinds of things. Kane is fresh water. Kanaloa, his brother, is seawater. So, uh, between these four main deities, you could cover just about everything that occurred in the natural world. So moving on now to experimentation, modeling, and prediction. Um, the Hawaiians manipulated natural systems toward particular goals is well seen in the Lokoi'a, the fish pond engineering systems, the design of Lo'i, the agricultural terraces, and the Awai, the irrigation canals. Um, Biological manipulations even, such as hand pollination of plants with the express purpose of increasing seed set, um, were also documented. In fact, it was in the 1800s that Mayenne, who was a visiting French botanist, 
I wrote in his journal about encountering an Indian woman, those are her, his words, remember Indian in those days meant Indian, indigen, indigenous, uh, bent over a Hawaiian poppy, manipulating its flowers. So he asked her what she was doing and she explained that by taking the ehu from one flower to another, ehu can be dust, and in this case pollen, um, from one flower to another she could increase the number of edible seeds produced. So a man was kind of astounded at this glimpse of the intimate empirical science of Hawaiians in their living landscape. Estimates of the pre-contact population in Hawaii range from 200,000 to 800,000, and at the higher end this rivals today's population densities and was entirely self-sufficient. Today, without our steady flux of imported goods and, and foods, we'd perhaps be eyeing each other hungrily in about three weeks or so. So the idea of manipulation that yields change in conditions, that's a very Hawaiian thing. Recently, some colleagues and I published a paper on using GIS models to indicate the footprint of both wet lo'i and dry land fields in pre-contact Hawaii. The paper examined the requirements of two major staple crops in Hawaii, kalo and uala, um, and filtered uh, the combinations of topographic, climatic, and soil conditions that provided for the highest potential of those two crops. For kalo, the optimum condition was plentiful water, low elevation, warm settings, and gentle slopes. For Uala, the critical condition was winter rainfall, sufficient to support growth of vines and tubers, but not so heavy as to leach nutrients from the soil. Um, older soils typically, typically had insufficient nutrients, so younger substrate age was another factor. When we tested the model against actual archaeological complexes that related to the two crops, we saw remarkable convergence. So the light blue outlines are the archaeological complexes related to those crops, and the blue and the red are the, are the um, modeled outlines of where those two crops should be grown. There was remarkable congruence, and it indicated that Hawaiians have developed many, if not all, areas of highest agricultural potential for kalo and uala. The Hawaiian model was expressed not in a computer file, but across tens of thousands of acres of land applied science at a landscape scale. Although in ancient Hawaii there might not have been any formal publication of results to encourage replication uh, of experiments, there was a certain oral, translation, uh, oral transmission of knowledge and testing through practice. Any knowledge that could not be practically replicated or gave inconsistent results would likely not be further promulgated. So these all alumni pointed the need to verify that which was heard by a direct experience. Thus, in a very practical sense, Hawaiian knowledge depended on replicability of results, another hallmark of the scientific method. So, hello, he pepeao, he ike makahoi. That is, did you just, did your ears hear that? Or did your eyes actually see it? O ka mea kupono pa'a, o ka mea hewa kapayake. That is, that which is righteous and true, hold on to it. That which is not fitting well, set it aside. They don't say reject it. They say, set it aside. Because remember what I told you about how Hawaiian knowledge is based on context. So what you hear may not be applicable to your situation. And so you don't apply that particular lesson to that. You set it aside. And one day, there will be another context that comes forward. And that which you were taught suddenly becomes perfectly true. Um, so sometimes people, people come up with, to me with two different stories about the same thing. And they say, which one's right and which one's wrong? Um, and that's not the question to ask. Yeah? When, you, when you hear something, um, you take particular attention to the source and the details of what you heard. Um, when someone asks you about that, you say, ah, I've heard of that. So-and-so on Molokai told me that. Right? I've heard that. I'm familiar with that, with that saying. And they say, well, somebody on Kauai says, says it's not that, that it's this. I so, said, well, they're on a different island, and the situations and the context for their, for their knowledge is a, is a different context. So you can't just say, that which was taught on Kauai is wrong, and that which is taught on Molokai is right. You might consider it more right on Molokai, because the context for it is more, more correct there. But I hope the take-home lesson is, when you encounter Hawaiian knowledge that seems inconsistent, the thing to do is pay attention to the source. Okay. Oh, and what's the last one? No, that's it. 
So if we accept that Hawaiians are scientists, what distinguishes Hawaiian science from Western science? There's some implied assumptions about Hawaiian versus Western approaches, especially with regard to worldview. Um, some of these are oversimplified here, but it serves to highlight contrasts. Um, in the Western sense, land is a commodity uh, and can be bought and sold. Uh, and in the Hawaiian context, land is a conscious entity which supports you in a reciprocal relationship as you support it. Um, in the second, biological elements are often manipulated dramatically from wild toward human-friendly domesticated forms in a Western approach. Um, and in the traditional Hawaiian approach, many of the systems were semi-wild. That is, many of the contexts of the, of, the, um, of the growth of a particular crop plant was based on selecting a place in which the ecosystem was appropriate for that crop plant, um, as was shown by the archaeology versus the modeling for, for optimal conditions for Kalo and Uwala. Uh, people are hired as labor and realize the scope of work, uh, and in the, Hawaiian, uh, in the Hawaiian viewpoint, people are connected spiritually with what they're doing and where they are. And, and so it's a matter of choosing which people are right for the particular job at hand. Uh, living things are objects uh, to be manipulated uh, versus living things as conscious individuals uh, cared for in the context of where they are. Uh, and then biological elements are not cultural elements, uh, typically in a Western viewpoint. That viewpoint is changing. We, we hear things like biocultural conservation nowadays, and that's an evolution of thought that I think is a good one. Um, in the days, in the first days of the, of the, of the restoration of Kaho Olave, there were two separate uh, committees, the Cultural uh, Restoration Committee and the Natural Resource Restoration Committee. And one day, we were meeting on the same day in the same place, and we realized that the two sides were talking about completely different things, even though, uh, and I was in the, I was in the natural resources um, uh, side of the thing, and uh, Kelly E. Pang was now at Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and I were, decided we were gonna peek at what the cultural folks were talking about, and it was all about stones and sites, and, um, and like not a single living thing was in their, on their discussion table. And so we decided to invade their, invade their group uh, and make the point that, that biological resources of Koho Olave are every bit as important to the cultural uh, restoration plan as the archaeology and, the, uh, and that side of the thing. And so that kind of aha moment led to a melding of those two. Um, and even though they still wrote separate archaeological cultural restoration plans and natural resource restoration plans, um, the two were merged in that but the living context of the living context of of cultural restoration um, was given attention. Okay. So uh, Hawaiian worldview example: the Hawaiian Awo Pueo is indigenous to Kaho Olave. It feeds largely on non-native rodents. Um, and in the Hawaiian worldview, the Pueo is for many Hawaiian families one of the kino lao of Aumakua. Um, to be treated with utmost respect as a revered ancestral form. So, although, uh, say, the, the animal restoration folks on Kaho Olave would say, well, pueo are only seasonally on Kaho Olave, you know, when the uh, rat and mouse populations boom after the winter rains, and then they fly back to Maui again. And so we're not really that worried about, about pueo on Kaho Olave. Um, but, uh, the spiritual connection of Pueo to Kaho Olave would, in a Hawaiian cultural context, make Pueo one of the central um, aspects of Kaho Olave's um, cultural restoration. Okay, so a Hawaiian botanist or Hawaiian archaeologist would be just as excited to see a Pueo on island as the zoologist would be. That's uh, because Pueo is not only a biological feature but a deep, really, deeply cultural symbol. Uh, there was a time when I was on Anko Olave for about a week uh, with the other committee members talking about, uh, thinking about uh, the restoration needs of the islands. And even though in those days, I was before the clearing, this was a very dangerous place to be. You couldn't really wander off, but I got really tired of being in the barracks at, at Hanakanaita. So one, um, one day, just before dawn, 
uh, everybody's sleeping, so I decided, okay, well, you know, the explosive ordnance folks are sleeping also, and I'll, I'll just sneak out, and I'll go to the top of the pool closest to, closest to the barracks, and got there to the top and didn't blow up, so that was good. And, and uh, Kumulek had just taught me a chant to the, to the Aumakua that, were, that were, was meant to be um, chanted in the pre-dawn. And so I stood on the top of the pu'u and as the sky started to lighten on the, on the horizon, I began to um, chant that chant. And within the first three or four lines, um, in the darkness or in the lightning darkness, I see dark shapes moving across my field of vision. I'm wondering what is going on. And then I hear the light whoosh, whoosh of wings. And then I realized that there were perhaps four owls that were circling around me as I was chanting that. It was everything that I could do to retain my composure and complete the, complete the Odi. And as I completed it, um, they continued circling, and, but their circle got wider and wider until, until they were gone from view. And I stood there until, well, I didn't, I didn't want to be nabbed outside oh, without the explosive ordinance detail accompanying me. So I, I stood there for another 15 minutes or so, and then I snuck back to, to camp again, but that was an awesome uh, experience, experience on that island. And when I told Kumbulek about that, he just smiled. <laughs> and he's a Maui person too. So, the tendency of Western approaches to separate natural resource and cultural resources um, is seen in the common practice of creating separate natural resource management plans and cultural resource management plans, as I mentioned. Uh, the Hawaiian approach of natural resources as cultural resources is reflected in the current trend to characterize biocultural resources. Um, and this uh, example of uh, the he'e, which is the kino of Kanaloa um, on a shrine at Kapo'olawe. So Western science has a reputation of being coldly objective, while Hawaiian knowledge is not divorced from emotion, is said to be guided mai kana'o, from the gut. In truth, intuition and passion are critical to scientific inquiry in both Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian contexts, but the Hawaiian approach embraces intuition and feeling readily, while Western science um, might view intuition as the least objective part of the process of inquiry and mistrust decisions that are made, made on intuitive hunches alone. This is a key point in the perceived conflict between science and culture, but any respected and, and experienced cultural practitioner would have seen that not all hunches are reliable and that the best intuitive guidance is based on long experience and perhaps a subconscious matching of options with that which is known to be true. That is, what feels pono in the na'au is what fits best with a lifetime of learning. It should also be pointed out that the objective approach, um, a, especially a coldly objective approach, can be a limitation to Western science when it allows for amoral or immoral scientific developments. Some of these have been of disservice to humankind, and such a history accounts for much of the general public's current distrust of science. Did anybody see the National Geographic um, uh, issue that had on the title The War on Science. Nobody reads National Geographic here? Uh, I must be old school or something. But it was a, it was an amazing uh, article that talked about um, how few, uh, how the percentage of folks uh, 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 of the general population in the U.S. Uh, believe in science. Um, and uh, many are willing to believe things that would be completely rejectable if you looked rationally at it. So it's an interesting uh, trend, and not a good trend as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay, anyway, off the, off the soapbox. So we sometimes see clear examples of Western science converging upon long-standing tenets of traditional Hawaiian knowledge. So as I mentioned, Hawaiians speak of the na'au as a source of ideas and wisdom, and Western science especially during the 1800s and 1900s, kind of demeaned the quaint idea of the intestinal tract being the brain of Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. However, recently the findings of Dr. Gershon, Michael D. Gershon, author of The Second Brain, demonstrate how the enteric nervous system, that is the network of nerves that are related to the digestive system, um, is relatively independent of brain spinal cord contact and in fact provides powerful feedback on our behavior creating a sense of unease when a decision is potentially wrong or dangerous. So Gershon speaks of the enteric nervous system as a holdover from our ancient evolutionary past. 
while the Hawaiian would speak of the same thing as listening within to the guidance of ancestors mai, that is, from the distant past. So to balance the idea of Western and Hawaiian approaches as distinct, there are also many, many commonalities relevant to restoration approaches in this case, though these commonalities run broad and apply to other modern situations. For example, um, both Western and Hawaiian approaches recognize ecological zones, uh, recognize manipulative experimentation, they recognize the need for pest control, that is, manipulation of ecosystem process, uh, species transport, uh, transplantation, um, both relied heavily on expert consultation uh, and on imposing and lifting of restrictions on behavior and resources and both expressed concern for the future of resources. Practical application of Hawaiian knowledge takes us beyond shared practices and into modern management actions, especially on Kahu'olabe. Attention to weather and seasonal climate, management of semi-wild ecosystems, well-developed agricultural protocols, propagation of seeds by cutting, sand pollination, and cultivars, um, specialized techniques for work in, for growing things in the dry lands, like rock mulching, which is not something that one often thinks about. Hawaiian knowledge extends to human interactions, coordination, and cooperation. Ho'oponopono is the science of dispute resolution. Central to Hawaiian life is the idea of blending of material and spiritual. And success in life is defined by physical, moral, and spiritual growth. So, traditional knowledge supports modern scientific endeavors. And before 1989, the nesting colonies of the endangered Hawaiian petrel, the Uahu, on Kauai, was unknown to Western science. But according to Mo'olelo of the island of Kauai, Lohaka was the nephew of Kane Aloha and was trained to be a kiamanu, a bird catcher. He seasonally lived on the cliffs of Wainiha near Mauna Hina to wait for the Uaku birds. The place is called Haleo Lauhaka, the house of Lauhaka. So in the summer of 1989, we selected to camp at the Kale, Haleo Lauhaka, essentially reoccupying the house of Lauhaka, and there we heard the night calls of the Uaku returning to their nests in the Uluhe covered cliffs uh, for the first time in modern history confirming the oral tradition and demonstrating the value of Mo'olelo to biologists. Another example comes out of the geological mapping of West Molokai. Um, it says, Aya kiana ko'i i kalua ko'i. There, at kalua ko'i is an ad's quarry. So, the ko'i, of course, was the main tool in ancient Hawaii. Um, you built everything with that, from canoes to your house to, to the lake. Uh, Kalua Ko'i is a place on the west end of Molokai. Its name harkens to the vitally important Ko'i resources to be found there. When the geological map of Molokai was first drafted by the famous geologist Harold Stearns, it was funded by sugar planters whose primary motivation was water resources. So the water-rich east Molokai was extremely well mapped, while west Molokai was treated as a simple, um, nearly undifferentiated unit. Um, John Sinton, geology professor here, took on the task of remapping West Molokai, and what he found impressed him greatly. So here's the, here's the geological map of, of West Molokai. Um, he found that the major capping lava series um, uh, existed there, and that every single one of them had adds quarries. Um, there were also smaller beds of uh, more specialized um, capping lavas, also with as quarries. And everywhere he went, he found Hawaiians had established quarries in the capping lavas. Moreover, the highest quality adzes were to be found in a specific subset of the capping lavas, shown in darker blue. And every single example of this subtype, he found particularly well-used adz quarry sites. So this led Dr. Sinton to remark that Hawaiians were superb regional geologists, uh, recognizing the shared characteristics of distinct exposures and applying this in their search for the sources of their most important primary tool. Hawaiian science resulted in some remarkable emergent patterns as well, especially in the realm of applied ecosystem services. When you overlay the major distribution of um, ecological systems, the Apupua'a boundaries in black, um, these show remarkable distribution of resource areas from summit to ocean. But note in particular the convergence of Apupua of the central leeward uh, Kokolau toward the hugely productive estuarine systems of Pu'uloa, now largely destroyed by industrialization and pollution. 
So what I'm talking about is you would start up here in the mountains and then take whoo, a quick turn down to catch a piece of Pu'uloa um, all around all around that uh, all around that area. So it's not well known that Oahu and not Molokai had the largest number of fish ponds, mostly lining the Awalawa Pu'uloa, the many locks of Pu'uloa now called Pearl Harbor. So um, what is this one all about? Uh, Ike Hawaii often requires a broad geographic knowledge for full understanding. This is because the Hawaiian concept of Aina is made up of layers within layers. This allows a Kanaka from anywhere in Hawaii to consider Aina simultaneously as his Pahale, his house lot, his Ahupua'a, the land section he lives in, his Moku or district, um, his Mokupuni or island that he lives in, and his Pai Aina, his archipelago, and ultimately all the way to the Honua, the whole world. Um, that affects what is happening right around him or her. So here's an example of the extent of place connections that makes sense when the concentric context is understood. Um, Pu'umo'ivi is an ad quarry on Kaho'olawe. Kaho'olawe is an Ahupua'a of Honua'ula district on Maui. Honua'ula is one of 12 moku of, Hawa of Maui Island. Um, Hamakualoa, Hamakuamoko, Ko'olau, Hana, Kipahulu, Kaupo, Honua'ula, Kaikinui, Kula, Lahaina, Ka'anapali, and Wailuku. In French Polynesia, um, was found an amazing thing. Ko'olawe is a manifestation of Kanaloa, one of the four principal Akua of Hawaii, god of seafaring. Ko'olawe was a seafaring training site, preparing navigators for voyaging between Hawaii and the rest of Polynesia. And an ad from Pu'umo'ivi was recently found in the Tuamotu archipelago. So you take the whole world, in other words, all of Oceania, Moana Nuya, Kiwa, and, and take your concentric rings back to Kaho'olawe um, in that way. So the future of Ike Hawaii now. Now what would it take to wield Hawaiian science toward a vision um, in December of 2010, the Hawaii Conservation Alliance made this statement in a position paper called Hawaiian Culture and Conservation in Hawaii. It, the preamble reads, Integration of Native Hawaiian approaches and knowledge systems with conventional conservation efforts is essential to achieve a vision of sustainable communities of people actively perpetuating thriving lands and seas through management and restoration. So, the challenge for the future is how to train professionals in dual worlds so they can wield the best of both of those systems. Um, I think it would take uh, quite a few things. One, it takes language skills. Hawaiian knowledge is transmitted using the subtleties of Hawaiian language. Number two, it takes a firm grounding in Hawaiian natural history. Thank goodness you're here. Mahalo for that. And three, a firm grasp of traditional Hawaiian pre-contact and historical accounts. We need to know how we got to where we are now. Um, in order to, to move from there forward. Because Ike Hawaii was transmitted orally, much was lost in the epidemics of the 1800s, and only portions of Hawaiian knowledge that were shared by surviving families and by those scholars, including non-Hawaiians, who took the time to render into writing that which was previously entirely orally transmitted. Only that survived into modern times. So we're a little bit hobbled, um, but more and more of what has been uh, put into millions of pages in the Hawaiian language newspapers is coming to light these days. Um, and I see a bright future in the, in the rapprochement between Hawaiian cultural approaches and Western approaches in the future. So with that in mind, mahalo to you all. <laughs>